Detective Steve Reed from the San Diego County Sheriff's Department. Detective Reed has led the Marijuana Eradication Program for the County of San Diego for several years now. And when you look at the numbers, it's pretty clear that Steve's efforts have been at or near the top of people who do this kind of work across the nation. Uh, his work has resulted in the arrests of 442 suspects, the confiscation of 454 weapons, and also the seizure of assets in excess of $11 million. Congratulations to Detective Steve Reed. Insert a fresh magazine if you need one. I'm a San Diego Sheriff's Deputy assigned to the San Diego Integrated Narcotic Task Force. It's run under the auspices of the Fire. Drug Enforcement Administration. Scan. This is a drug war, you know, so we're out there to win it. I've been running this marijuana program uh, since 1988, so we're going on 18 years. I don't, I don't know if you could ever find a job that fits me any better. I can go out and be physical and look for marijuana and be a long-haired hippie and, you know, and be a police officer. What else, what else could you ask for? Come here, Murph. Come here, Murph. Come here. Good girl. Oh, the Murfer. Hey, Pepper. Hey, Tony, what's happening? Gonna do one of our normal e yep. flights today? Yeah, I'm gonna fly a couple bags, whatever it takes. Today, we'll be flying in the north, northeast section of San Diego County. See if anything's popped up. The plants are starting to get bigger, start to reveal themselves. We start to see them coming up underneath the brush and stuff. Yeah, the canyon on about 2 o'clock. Got it. I'm the marijuana spotter for the county. I just have the ability to be able to see marijuana from the air. Oh, look at the brown stuff down low. I have a vision or color problem that my greens are probably stronger than most people's. Slow down your turn. Slow down your turn. If I go outside and look, then I'll see 50 shades of green, where if I talk to somebody else, they say 5 or 10. So I think that's assisted me in being able to see the different shades of green while we're flying over to determine you know, whether it's marijuana or some other type of just natural vegetation. It's about 10 miles south of Brown, those dead trees are covering the marijuana plants. It's all out our door now. It's all about 50 yards up the creek bottom. It's all salt and pepper right there below us. Yeah, I got it. You can see right here? Yeah. It's a lot of dope. A lot of weed down there. The ton of it down there. I just happened to look out uh, right side of the helicopter down the drainage and the plants just all popped up, perfect time. Sun was hitting them, they were all sparkling. All right, that's our uh, gold mine for the day. Hey, Tony, keep coming. Right on. Okay, let's get out of here. There's always a chance that uh, there's the gardeners gonna be there, the cultivators. Um, it's a big garden, it's gonna be worth a lot of money. They could be protecting it. Get everybody there approximately 545, that should get us in there just about sun up. Be moving it by six. Yeah, we'll do that tomorrow. That's the best garden I've seen this summer. Steve Reed is an individual that truly believes in what he's doing. He believes, and I'm convinced, and I know, that Steve Reed makes a difference. A person does not essentially wrap themselves around a cause and have as much zeal 
as a Steve Reed without being absolutely sure in their mind, in their heart, that they are serving a higher, a higher mission, a higher cause for the benefit of society. And that's exactly what he does. The war on drugs is the last dying smell from the Nixon administration. This isn't a war, it's a misuse of the word. It's an apparatus of control. You can tell it all, by the way, by the name they give to the person who's in charge of this mad scheme, a czar. The whole point of the United States is no bloody czar. No monarch of any kind. And I'm proud to nominate John P. Walters, where he will serve as a valuable member of my cabinet. But the czar is exactly the right name for this program and for this mentality. When we push back, the drug problem gets smaller. It's absolutist. It's unquestionable. It's fanatical and it's corrupt. What keeps this thing going is the government, especially the federal government and organizations like the Partnership for Drug-Free America, their willingness to spend hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, taxpayer dollars oftentimes, on propaganda. Putting out propaganda in every case that's essentially an ounce of truth embedded in a pound of lies and bull and exaggeration. Wanna get high? No way, man. That stuff's for losers. The creation of the media campaign was an enormous achievement in, in our office. Oh, the legalizers were livid. You can't fight drugs by TV. Guess what? Everybody advertises on TV, whether it's Coca-Cola to political campaigns to the value of being drug free and the dangers of using drugs like marijuana. Man, watch out! And, and it worked. We had some very effective ads. There was a 13% reduced proclivity of people to, of kids to use drugs when they saw the ad that had the actor smashing the dishes. We had another very good ad that had, um, my mommy talks to me about everything. This is a little girl. And she talks to me about this and that and this and that. And what does your mother say to you about drugs? Dead silence. Those were my two favorite ads that I thought were enormously powerful. This absurd uh, uh, continuation of this prohibition is largely a function of ignorance. In 1967, because I was so concerned about this drug marijuana, I decided to do a review of the literature. I was then persuaded by Harvard University Press to do a book. The book came out in 1971, Marijuana Reconsidered. I learned that uh, what was being said about this drug was, uh, was mythological. You couldn't find the data to really support it. It turns out that marijuana came across as a remarkably non-toxic drug. Cannabis is a plant. Now, in the plant, there are somewhat more than 60 molecules called cannabinoids. THC is the most active. THC stands for tetrahydrocannabinol. People find smoking marijuana very useful for a whole host of symptoms. And if you inhale it, you get the effect within a very short period of time. So you can titrate it. By titrate it, I mean uh, you can take just enough to get rid of your symptoms and stop. The government hates to admit that they've already acknowledged that marijuana is a medicine. They acknowledged it in the 1970s and 80s when they allowed dozens of Americans to receive a monthly supply of marijuana from the government's marijuana farm at the University of Mississippi. Some of those people are still alive and still obtaining it today, their can monthly canister of marijuana. Now, here's where I keep my cannabis. Keep it refrigerated, it stays fresher. I receive one tin of 300 pre-rolled cigarettes, approximately 300 cigarettes, every 25 days from the federal government. And here it's hemetically sealed with wax to try to keep the freshness and the strength up. This marijuana was actually grown right here in 
April of 1996. So it's been packaged and frozen since then. And then you open it up. Okay, inside you'll see that there's approximately 300 rolled cigarettes to this tin and sold by a cigarette machine. What this can means to me is for the next 25 days, I don't have to worry about medicine. That I know that I'll be as well as I possibly can be. And that I don't have to worry about if somebody's going to bust my door down and come arrest me because of this medicine. The disorders that I suffer from are multiple congenital cartilaginous exostosis and a variant of the syndrome pseudo-pseudo-hypoparathyroidism. In lay terms, what it means is bone tumors that grow outwardly from the long bones such as this grow outwardly into the muscles and the veins, stretching the muscles and the veins, making it very painful. But more important, any kind of movement can tear the muscle or tear the vein, and I could hemorrhage and a clock could break off, go to my heart, my brain, my lungs, I'm dead. I usually try to get in, if I can, 10 to 12 marijuana cigarettes per day. What the cannabis definitely does is relax the muscles going over these tumors. Thereby, I can move and, and not have to worry about tearing anything. So I'm ready to go to work and, and I try to make some money for myself and my clients. More important for my clients. Uh, when people see me taking my medicine, they don't understand that it's medicine, and they think all I'm trying to do is get high, and that, and that I've got you know some kind of balls to be able to do it, do it in public. Of course, I try to explain to them right away that it's medical use provided by the federal government, and I'm sure most people just kind of laugh and go, "Yeah, right." I became the second person in the United States to receive medical cannabis from the federal government. Robert Randall was the first patient. We welcome to Larry King Live, Bob Randall, the first American ever to gain legal access to marijuana because of his glaucoma condition. Why are you allowed to use these, Robert? I have a disease called glaucoma, and marijuana at this point is the only drug that will help prolong my sight. You Every... could smoke it now legally, couldn't you? Sure. Do it for me. Okay. Yes. This is a first. I want yeah, you to know, Larry. <laughs> I spent 27 years with Bob Randall, and 25 of those years he was using 10 marijuana cigarettes a day, federally supplied. And I can assure you he was not a stoner. Um, he had a terrific memory. He was extremely articulate. He was highly motivated when it came to, particularly to this issue. I think the only thing surprising here is that a small group of unelected bureaucrats have so long resisted making marijuana medically available. Essentially, it comes down to almost a theologic argument. They want to pretend that marijuana is simply evil, and I think we have to be more rational than that. We have to realize that marijuana has good and bad uses. Bob was treated on every conventional medication that was available, and it was only through the addition of marijuana that his eye pressure was lowered to within the safe range. Told at 25 that he would be blind by the time he was 30, marijuana made the critical difference, and Bob could see up until the time of his death in 2001. We were arrested in August of 1975 for growing four marijuana plants on our sun deck in Washington, D.C. And once Robert found out that the federal government was already conducting research, on marijuana as a possible glaucoma treatment, that made him very angry. He could not reconcile in his mind that we were being called criminals for what the federal government was already well aware of. So we went to trial in July of 1976, and the lawyers pleaded that Robert needed medical access to marijuana based on his medical need. Uh, the trial was held before Judge James Washington in Washington, D.C.